Muy buenos días a cada uno de ustedes. Good day to everyone. Speaking in indigenous language. Again, again, good morning in Maya Kiche. We want to send you a good from our energy. So, well, a beautiful day for everyone. And Good day, good afternoon, or good evening, depending from where you are today. We have met so that we can talk about a situation and leaders that are important in this community. We are talking about the defenders of indigenous women's rights. We have called upon you to come here in this space and show and share our live stories with everyone here. We have joyfully organized this activity in order to make visible the situation of human rights, the women indigenous defenders of human rights. It's very important for us to bring to the table the, these stories because not only does it make the situations of indigenous peoples visible, but it also makes it visible the situation and conditions that a lot of our sisters are facing around the world. Something that is important to highlight to highlight when we talk about defenders of human rights, it's that for us, it has a collective dimension and we are not talking about individuality of a woman defender, but we are talking about women defenders. And we are also talking about the importance of the struggle for human rights both at an individual and collective level. <laughs> at this time, many sisters are facing difficult situations of prosecution. <laughs> we are facing multiple violence against our sister defenders. This is why we have promoted this space to listen from their own voices, the situations and conditions that they are undergoing, as well as those stories of change, these good practices, these support that is usually not seen. So we give you a warm welcome to this space, to all of our panelists, and we welcome all the participants that have registered through Zoom and from FIMI, we are very happy to welcome you in this space. I do not want to keep talking because we really want to listen to those voices and then we will do a closing statement to see the main statements, the main proposals and demands and the path to follow. So thank you and welcome from wherever you are. And I give the floor to our next panelist. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you, depending on where in this world you are. I hope you are all well. Uh, before I introduce myself, I'd just like to remind you um, that we have interpretation in Spanish and French. So please click on the globe icon in the lower part of your Zoom window and select your language of choice. Uh, please allow me now to introduce myself. I am Christina Koch. I will be your moderator. I am also the global 
Advocacy Coordinator at the Indigenous Peoples' Rights International. I'm a Maya Ekchi woman from Southern Belize, or a human and indigenous rights advocate. I welcome you all to this webinar entitled Indigenous Women, Human Rights Defenders, Stories from the Front Lines and the Road Ahead. This webinar is co-organized and co-hosted by FEMI, uh, the Foro Internacional de Mujeres Indígenas. This is a global network that unites indigenous women from the seven social cultural regions of the world, along with the Indigenous Peoples' Rights International, which is a global organization a global indigenous peoples organization that works to protect indigenous peoples rights defenders and unite and amplify the call for justice and respect for indigenous peoples rights. The webinar um, aims to raise awareness on the achievements and the struggles of indigenous women, human rights defenders. Uh, we also want to highlight the key recommendations on indigenous women, human rights defenders in the CIDAO General Recommendation 39. And of course, uh, we want to build solidarity among Indigenous and non-Indigenous partners and allies for the protection of Indigenous women, human rights defenders. We will be hearing from a distinguished panel of Indigenous women, human rights defenders who are on the front lines in their communities advancing human rights. I would um, take the pleasure now to introduce our panel of speakers. Um, First, I'd like to introduce Ms. Kara Lenina Tagoa. She is a labor union organizer and the Secretary for International Affairs of the Kulusang Mayo Uno. She's also an Indigenous Peoples Rights Advocate and come from the tribe of Limos, uh, Pinukpuk in the Kalinga. She's a student of sociology at the University of the Philippines. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Annabel Carlon Flores. She's a lawyer and a renowned leader from the Yaqui tribe in Mexico. Her town Loma de Bacun is facing an oil pipeline that transnational Ainova is trying to build in her territory without the consent of the community. Annabella has been threatened by her opposition to this project. And in December, 2016, she was kidnapped along with her husband. Our third speaker is Ms. Jean Roach. Um, she is from the Minuku uh, Lakota tribe, a survivor of the 1975 Oglala firefight, co-director of the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. And then we have Ms. Zahia Bashir. She's an indigenous woman human rights defender uh, from the Iguesa Friend village in the municipality of Idur Bozogin Tizir, my apologies for not being able to pronounce the French uh, words. In, she's from Algeria. She started the struggle for an identity very early at 13 and gave courses in the Amazing language uh, for students. She has been very active in um, politics and the defense of human rights in general and women's rights in particular for her identity, her region, her indigenous Amazon people. And then finally, uh, last but not least, we have Miss McMillery, uh, who began singing uh, with her father at the age of five. Since then, she has discovered her love for hip hop and her Mapuche culture, drawing on experiences in order to always deliver her music with a social content. Uh, McMillery is a 16 year old Mapuche lyrics, uh, lyricists, and, her part and she has participated in different music festivals together with a different urban music artists. In addition to her Mapuche rap singing, she is a spokesperson for the Mapuche Children's Network and an environmental activist where she fights for the protection of sacred territories. In January of 2023, she appeared in the cover of the New York Times uh, referring to one of the artists with the greatest international projection. This is our distinguished panel of speakers. It gives me great pleasure to welcome them and we look forward to hearing from them um, and their, their personal stories um, as they uh, defend human rights. 
Um, I would like now to pass the floor to our executive director from the Indigenous Peoples' Rights International, Ms. Joan Carling, who will give us an overview on Indigenous women's human rights defenders and uh, the Sidao General Recommendation 39. Ms. Joan. Uh, thank you, uh, Christina, and also my uh, welcome to all the participants to this uh, important exchange on Indigenous uh, women as we celebrate tomorrow the International uh, Women's Day. Uh, I would uh, also want to appreciate our joint collaboration with FIMI uh, for this important work that we're doing in advancing the protection of Indigenous women. I'm supposed to give an overview and also the link, uh, par particularly on the issue of Indigenous women's uh, human rights defenders and also uh, on the GR39 of the Committee on CEDAW. Uh, that's a general recommendation 39 uh, by the committee. So with this, uh, I, I, I wish to focus uh, on, on, on also the, the rights uh, that human rights defenders uh, have that needs to be uh, protected. So with this, I uh, want to, to state that indigenous women at the front lines of defending women's rights and indigenous people's rights are incre increasingly being subjected to threats, attacks and systemic violations of our rights as women and as indigenous peoples. For indigenous women, we are disproportionately subjected to violence and even criminalization when we exercise and defend our collective rights as indigenous peoples. This condition aggravates the multiple layers of discrimination when we are uh, discrimination we are already experiencing as indigenous women. I would like to cite some serious attacks on indigenous women, such as killings, rapes from different regions of the world that shows that this is a global crisis that needs to be addressed with a sense of urgency and solidarity. Here are some emblematic cases of attacks uh, where in the, with, against indigenous women with no access to justice for victims and their families and no accountability of perpetrators. In Canada, Joyce Echakwan was murdered in September 2020, a 37-year-old indigenous woman from Manawan, Quebec, who was verbally and physically abused by medical staff before dying of cardiac arrest. Another case is the killing of Chantelle Moore in June 2020, and she is a 26-year-old Indigenous woman from British Columbia who was shot and killed by police officers. Both incidents sparked outrage calling these cases a systemic racism and violence against indigenous women that should be met with justice and an end to impunity committed against indigenous peoples in Canada. In Asia, an Adivasi woman was brutally gang raped and murdered in December 2019 in the state of Jharkhand in India, and another indigenous woman was killed in an attack in the Philippines by by the military in the province of, of Bukidnon, while a number of indigenous women activists in the Cordillera, where I come from, are being charged with cases of cyber libel, and many more are tagged as terrorists or supporting local terrorists to silence them. In Latin America, an indigenous woman was murdered in La Paz in Bolivia in December, and three women were killed by paramilitary attack in the Colombian Amazon in December 2019. In Africa, an indigenous woman was killed in an attack by the Fulani herdsman in the state of Kaduna in Nigeria, and another woman was also killed in the attack by armed men in the eastern province in the Republic of Congo. These are these there, I mean, there are more unreported cases of violence, criminalization, and attacks to indigenous women, and many are in the front line of defending our lands 
territories and resources, including waters, and remain highly vulnerable to violations of their rights and attacks to their dignity and well-being. What is happening also today is that while women are defending our lands against projects for the green transition, for example, uh, dams and, and, and uh, windmills and, and solar, uh, that, uh, that do not have the consent of the communities are now subjected to different forms of threats and, and violence. And what is coming out as a trend is that because, uh, because of the prevailing patriarchy, uh, it's easier to attack indigenous women because uh, many do not have access to justice. Many will not bring their case to court because they don't have the money to bring their case to court. And, 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 and that, that is also the one leading to impunity, right? So many, men, an increasing number of women in the front lines, because for women, we, have the, the, we are closer to, to, to nature and the environment. Uh, uh, and, and so when we, we protect these lands and resources, that's when this kind of violence happen. And uh, it happens with impunity and continues to happen again and again because there is no access to justice. So this is a serious problem that we are facing now. The, the good thing is that as part of the work of, of addressing the, the discrimination of women, the Committee for the Elimination of, of uh, Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, they have closely studied the application of CEDAW for indigenous women. And they did this in consultation with indigenous women and, and have issued their general recommendation 39 on indigenous women and girls in October 26, 2022. Uh, CEDAW the, the, is a legally binding human rights instru instrument protecting the rights of women and thereby the general recommendations 39 on indigenous women and girls is an additional tool on how states should ensure the respect and protection of the rights of indigenous women and girls. It should thereby be part of the government reporting to the CEDAW committee as part of its human rights obligations. This, the report, this, or uh, the GR39 as it is called, covers the different dimensions of discrimination experienced by indigenous women as women and as indigenous peoples, thereby addressing both the individual and collective rights of indigenous women. Moreover, the political, economic, cultural, and social rights of indigenous women uh, uh, and are interwoven with our rights to our collective rights as indigenous peoples, which makes which puts, puts us in a unique and distinct condition from the rest of the women's population. The, 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 the distinction on how we should be able to exercise our collective rights is at the heart of the GR 39, uh, recommend, the, the, these recommendations. GR 39 also specifically addresses the issues and concerns of indigenous women human rights defenders. GR 39 acknowledges the risks, threats, and various forms of violence and attacks to indigenous women defenders, such as the case, cases I mentioned earlier. It reminds states of their duties to recognize protect and support the work of indigenous women defenders, including by providing them with access to justice, safety, and security. I want to emphasize these issues that states need to ensure that indigenous women human rights defenders are provided with access to justice, safety and security so that they can continue their work. It also calls on states to ensure that indigenous women defenders are not subjected to reprisal or criminalization for their work. That means 
the, the, the cases I have mentioned earlier should not happen. And if they still continue to happen, there should be access to justice. Uh, this, uh, and when we say that when uh, indigenous women should be supported, that means they should also be provided with adequate resources, including economic resources to carry out their work. Uh, this recommendation by the, the committee, the CEDAW committee, recognizes the importance and the critical role that indigenous uh, women human rights defenders are doing and that they need resources and uh, including economic resources to be able to carry out this work. Now, the specific, what are the specific contents of the GR39 that are highly relevant to indigenous women in the work that we do. First is that it, it asserts and, and uphold the rights, the right to protection from discrimination based on gender and indigenous identity. So it, it combines both. The, the, these are the what we call the layers of discrimination, right, to indigenous women. Then the right to protection against gen, against gender from gender based violence, the right to access justice and remedies, the right to participate in decision making processes, the right to freedom of expression and association, the right to access to education, healthcare, and other public services the right to self-determination and autonomy, the right to free prior and informed consent, the right to access and control over land and natural resources, and the right to cultural and spiritual practices. This is a bundle, bundle of rights that includes both the individual rights and collective rights of indigenous women, uh, of indigenous peoples and women, such as the right to self-determination and autonomy, the right to free prior and informed consent, and the right to access and control over lands, territories, and resources, and the right to cultural and spiritual practices. This means that indigenous women should not be criminalized or subjected to any form of violence when we practice our livelihood activities as part of our access and control of our lands and resources, and also to our cultural and spiritual practices. Moreover, it also stresses stress the obligation of state to provide protection to the and and the right to access to education healthcare and other public uh, services and also that states should provide measures to indigenous women uh, in measures to protect indigenous women against gender based violence and to put to justice the perpetrators including state forces armed groups and, viol and domestic violence and access to justice that uh, to justice by women and that perpetrators are held to account to end impunity. The GR39 can also be used to protect indigenous women human rights defenders by ensuring that uh, our rights and freedoms are respected within our own communities by state and non-state actors. Further, GR39 can be used to advocate for the rights of indigenous women human rights defenders by raising awareness of the issues they face, including the threats and providing support and resources for them, including for security measures and appropriate services for their well-being. Uh, in uh, uh, at uh, at this point, I, I wish to mention uh, our our sincere appreciation for for the Lush Cosmetics for just uh, have um, conclude uh, just uh, had had a campaign uh, supporting indigenous women land and water defenders uh, by selling a, what a, a bath bomb to support uh, indigenous women uh, human rights defenders. 
And that, that really uh, helped us raise the visibility of, of indigenous uh, women who are at the front line. So this is, the, this, this is also the kind of, of uh, uh, raising awareness activities that we can do to highlight, to, put, to make uh, uh, indigenous women visible in the way they are actually contributing in protecting the planet and in achieving peace uh, in, in our areas. And finally, the GR39 can also be used to hold governments and other actors accountable for upholding the rights of indigenous women, human rights defenders. So, uh, so finally, just to conclude, as we celebrate the International Women's Day, let us remember the sacrifices and courage and persistence of our indigenous women defenders from across the globe. Uh, they have shed their blood, sweat, and tears so we can continue to live in our land's territories and resources. It is thereby our duty to continue to pave the way for the future generations to live in peace, dignity, social equity, and in harmony with nature. Let us thereby make use of the GR39 along with other human rights instruments to advance the protection of indigenous women, human rights defenders, and indigenous women in general. Let us also strengthen our collaboration with women and indigenous organizations at all levels from local, national, to global levels, levels, including support NGOs, academic donors, as they are critical in building a broad base of support in advancing protection of indigenous women, human rights defenders. We can only succeed with a strong solidarity relations and joint actions with various groups at all levels and with the leadership of indigenous women. So thank you, and I, I hope we, we I look forward to an an, uh, an interactive uh, conversation with our indigenous women human rights defenders who are with us in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Joan Carlin, um, for giving us an, an overview of uh, GR twenty uh, thirty nine and highlighting the key recommendations. Uh, we certainly look forward to a conversation around this uh, later on in the webinar. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Ms. Zahia Bashir, Algeria. Um, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Oui, oui. Okay. Alors, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sahir Bashir. Uh, I represent the uh, indigenous people, uh, the Amazia from Algeria. I'm the president, the chairwoman of an environmental association, and I also represent the women of Northern Africa in Iraq. The, I'm not going to go back uh, to the laws uh, because our sister spoke very well about the laws. So I'm going to share with you a small overview of my uh, road uh, as a fighter for over 27 years. I started at the age of 13. Yeah, I started very young. Uh, my father taught me how to write my uh, name in uh, Amazir, and I learned my maternal language before I learned Arabic at school. And that's how my fight started at the age of 13 as well. I went on stage and I was with an association, Amusraw, and I was a comedian as well and a comedian who had a main role on the Amazigh women in general and um, indigenous women and the rights of women. That means that I took this role at my young age of 13. And I want 
to, to show you a passage uh, in which uh, I uh, was uh, in the national and international festival to defend the rights of all women in general and Amazigh women more specifically. And also I was working at the emancipation of, the, of all women and uh, the main role of women where I couldn't and wouldn't be allowed to speak. And this um, main uh, stage, uh, that main uh, act was uh, a woman who couldn't, couldn't speak. And I, I actually walk over the taboos and I spoke like that in front of men. I was very active in the association and I learned what militantism, pacifism means, especially identities and the uh, meaning of organization and managing events. At school, I was a man, uh, member of the committee as a student. I, I'm going to try to walk over the events. I integrated the autonomous uh, committee at the university. And as uh, I was the only person who managed to pass the baccalaureate uh, in my family, everybody was happy for me. And the University of Murdmata is where I started my fight uh, for human rights. And uh, I joined several movements at the university as well, and there are so many events in my community, the Amazirs, and especially the women, and uh, the Amazir indigenous women, and all the events which shook Kabilia uh, after the assassination of Tunis, um, Natu Tunis who sacrificed his life for the Amazigh identity and also the cultural uh, association where I organize every year. I'm a member of a cultural association which uh, fought for the identity and I organized a huge uh, demonstration from the university to the tomb of Matthew Tunis to pay homage to him. I was also arrested several times uh, by the police and tortured uh, for 24 hours and in 2001 as well. Just to give you the image of uh, Zaya's fight, it was the assassination of a young uh, schoolgirl uh, and the, the Amazigh Spring. I organized several pacific demonstrations at university and also outside to, because I wanted the, to know the truth about that assassination and take to justice uh, all the people who, were, who had uh, ordered that uh, assassination. I was arrested several times even in 2001, that I prepared Molotov cocktails with oil inside uh, for that because uh, they, uh, they started fighting us with tear gas and we re uh, answered with uh, Molotov cocktails. Uh, only men used to fight for rights. So once again, I broke the taboos and uh, I represented uh, civil society, and I was the first ever woman integrating that and uh, breaking the taboos to participate. And uh, I took part in several such events to claim that women exist, not only men. And uh, I participated with men, and I wrote the platform of uh, Preventation of whatever we wanted, and such as recognizing our identity. And we wanted the Amazigh peoples to be independent together with the minorities. In the association, I integrated several associations 
to teach the Anasir language and fight uh, on fight the dangers, the environmental dangers in the area. And another time, as a woman, I walk over another taboo while I met with all the members of the village committee. And as the structures of the village committees only consisted in men and the elderly, and I also wanted to show that there are women in our village as well, and they have to be listened to and given a voice. And uh, in my area as well, the members of the village committee accepted to debate and organize the villages to fight against the proliferation, uh, proliferation of uh, um, debris and uh, refuse in the village. And in 2014, I was given that I was awarded the prize of the cleanest village, which I had launched in 2012. Uh, uh, that competition means that uh, there used to be a village between the various villages in the Amazir community, and uh, we were awarded uh, by Vilaya, and we were awarded the prize of the cleanest village. This adventure, with, this adventure with the villagers, where I was working a lot with the women, uh, had entailed many reactions in many other villages who also wanted to get organized and make their village an example of cleanliness. And I was uh, requested to hold conferences in other villages to eliminate as much refuse as possible. I'm going to speak a little bit about my political life. I am also a member of a major political party, the uh, USCD for Cultural and Democracy. And uh, so I am an Amazir and my culture and democracy must be integrated in my head. And uh, uh, also, as I was young, I took part in various actions organized by the same party, the organizations of the demonstration, and I was also the first one because I was at university. I integrated the committee, I organized the demonstration of the 20th April, and the truth about the assassination of our rebel singer. I was very active in defending human rights in general, and also the rights of women and the rights of the indigenous peoples. I also filled the, a, response, a post as the first elected uh, woman in 2004 five after leaving the university in 2004 in 2005 i was elected as the person in charge i was the first and youngest algerian woman to be elected in the world of men so it's not so easy that i was also supported by my father at all times so i broke this taboo as well i also took part in the congress uh, where i held several posts in charge. I was a member of the National Council, of the Regional Bureau, and the representative of women in the party. In 2012, I, I uh, still went forward, and uh, I was elected a member of uh, the group in the Vilaya, so my engagement and my political conviction uh, uh, made that, that I was chosen by the party to represent the party internationally in the USA, and I was welcome in 2006. Uh, it was absolutely wonderful because we visited. And, uh, I was uh, welcomed by uh, many senators and uh, a very important woman. It was an opportunity for me to talk about my situation as an Abbasia, the origins in Northern Africa. I took part in several meeting works with uh, senators and MPs in uh, Ohio, Michigan, and Washington. And I was wearing my traditional uh, dress. Uh, as you can see now, 
and also uh, dress with my flag. Uh, I, I always take part like that. And also, I always presented in all the events of the party. The 20th of April is an important date for the Amazir peoples. And I also always take part in the preparation of the demonstrations. In 2011, I took part in the events of the party. Uh, I give you one example only. When I was a young girl, I took part, but uh, now I was uh, in my seventh month of pregnancy and I went to Algiers to take part in a very important event. And I was arrested by a police officer who asked me, why uh, do you endanger your pregnancy? And my answer was, you took my life from me, so I fight for this baby if you give it a chance to leave. And he he told me to leave the room because, uh, because uh, it was another taboo to be broken. I, I'm also at OPAC. I'm a member of OPAC and representative of, Ameri of Northern African women. It's my third mandate. And I work on human rights and the rights of women and children. And uh, I went on several trainings on climate changes. And it's another uh, side of my work. And I was requested by several universities to represent the Vilaya, where I was uh, appointed and gave several, uh, and I was given several gifts to encourage me to train women in management, uh, tra train them on the ancestral practice to adaptation and resilience and climate changes. I was invited by the environmental minister to communicate on my work. And I talked about the practical example, which is purely indigenous. And my communication came first. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I work with indigenous women. I, I'm going to close now. Uh, I work with a group of indigenous women. And uh, I have a choir to be able to transmit the values and our Amazon culture. Uh, you can see my photo, which is integrated in the Amazigh language. And my photo and my culture is to be found in the Algerian school books. And that means that I was an example for environment and Amazigh people. And in 2022, I'm going to sum it up because I do not want to give you all the details in 2019. Uh, there was a big example in Algeria, and um, I was there as well. But in 2022, I was uh, arrested several times, and I was condemned to two years in prison, uh, plus a penalty for a woman who gave all her life to fight for the Amazir, for the fight of women. But uh, the gendarmerie knocked at my door at four o'clock in the morning in front of my two daughters who just cried in, two, in 2022. Just imagine it was last year. But after the lawyers um, pleaded and I was condemned as if I had uh, uh, put fire on cars and I'm a teacher and in my private light, I'm, I'm a teacher and an engineer in electronics and I work on renewable energies and refuse. And I, uh, I was also condemned to two uh, years in prison, but my lawyers and the whole population supported me and uh, so I was uh, acquitted, uh, uh, arrested several times. I was born in Amazir, and my name is the Fight for Women. Uh, okay. We fight, okay. all the women fight, and hand in hand, we will win. Uh, long live the women. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Sahia. Um, thank you uh, for sharing your story and for um, uh, making uh, visible the participation of Indigenous women. Um, I just want to take this 
time now just to give a gentle reminder to all speakers. Uh, we would like to give uh, sufficient time to everyone. So uh, you have eight minutes. Um, and without any further delay, I'd like to invite now Ms. Jean uh, Roch to uh, share with us her story. She is from the uh, Minakoho uh, Lakota tribe. Ms. Jean. Do, do we have uh, Miss Jean uh, Roque on, on, online? Can... While we prepare, uh, maybe we move on in the interest of time. Uh, we'll come I'm back sorry. to this. Oh, you're here. It. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. The yeah. floor is yours. Um, yeah, my name is Jean Roche. I'm from the Mini Koju Lakota tribe. Um, on my bio, I have as a survivor of the 1975 Oglala firefight. And one of the things that I'm doing today, now I've been working for the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee, who is a well-known human rights defender in the Lakota Nation. Uh, this story is big. So um, in the chat, I'll put our website. We have several um, several documents on our website, who is leonardpeltier.info. And I'm here to talk about uh, the different things that we've been fighting for over the generations. Um, actually, the story doesn't start with Leonard. It starts way back at first contact with 1890, the arrival of the non-natives and the attack on our nation. The genocide's been continued on. We had the boarding school era where many of our children were taken from our homes illegally, uh, forced into a, a foreign religion, beaten for not, for speaking our languages, killed. I mean, we have the stories and now the, the real stories coming out about all the different graves that are being found by these boarding schools or families being attacked. We also have a large population, like 80% of our women in South Dakota are in prison of Lakota. Um, also the same for the men, the numbers are close to 80% for the men inside of the prison. So we have a big fight here. Um, and every time, uh, you know, we stand up where uh, we've been attacked, uh, the movement, we just celebrate, celebrated 50 years since the Wounded Knee occupation in 1973 by the American Indian movement. And so we're looking at what happened way back in 1973 compared to 2023, and there's not been very much change. Um, I work in Rapid City, South Dakota, which we name Racist City. We're in process of tearing down the racism um, pillars in our state. We've been attacked for generations for our land and resources. Our stories are all the same, but in different areas of the world. Um, we're right in the middle of the so-called democracy of the United States, which is not true. We all know that. But we're here to, um, to remind people that Lenin Peltier is going on its 48th year in prison. And we have so much documentation of all the, um, of the uh, fabricated evidence, the deaths. We have, you know, it's so enormous, this case. But until he's released, he'll, the United States government will never come to the table in good faith. You know, they have this political prisoner that's been in there for, um, I mean, I can't even imagine since I was like 15 years old when the firefight happened. Me and my brother were there when the uh, firefight happened on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation where the FBI illegal and illegally entered our camp started attacking men, uh, women and children. Um, we had elderly grandparents there. And one of our uh, brothers, Joseph Stuntz, is one of the people that were murdered there. Um, and he's never been, I mean, his case has never been um, investigated, along with 60 other people that have been killed within the reign of terror that we call it, that happened on the, you know, on the reservation there. 
we have those 60 un, um, investigated deaths. Uh, you know, it's really ironic that we have to ask the own uh, FBI of the United States government to uh, investigate themselves. You know, that's never going to happen. We're never going to get truth and justice. The same with us going to D.C. I mean, we're asking them to tell on themselves. Through the release of uh, FOIA, we've got several documents that prove the um, the uh, the falsified documents. Um, first of all, in the very beginning, when Mr. Peltier was in Canada facing extradition, they abused a Lakota woman and threatened her with death and her children being taken away unless she signed three affidavits that were that were taken to the Canadian government in the extradition hearing. The Canadian government would only extradite Leonard Peltier if they had an eyewitness. And it's really strange they went to this level because uh, Myrtle Porbear was her name and she never met Leonard Peltier, not one day. But she signed these falsified documents stating she was his girlfriend and she was there at the shootout and witnessed him shooting two FBI agents. So right there, day one, they started out, you know, I mean, they continued, not started, they continued the genocide on our people. At the same time, several acres of land on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation were signed back over to the United States government. Um, we know everything's all related. Uh, several of our um, women have been targeted. We have the name of Anime Aquash that was, um, <coughs> False with uh, rumors were taken about her, calling her an, an undercover uh, FBI agent within the people. And that's one of their tactics called Contalpro that they use against movements. They use it against the civil rights movements of the Black Panthers. Um, they use it against Honeywell workers, and that's just the way they operate. They use it against the Indian American Indian movement, sending infiltrators to discredit the movement. Um, just so many things that we could talk about. I'm trying to squeeze it all in eight minutes, but um, our fight continues within our community here in Rapids, in Races City. We have an 18 year old um, granddaughter that went to jail. Um, we have vicious attacks by the police department. She just gave birth seven days before. Her name is Abby Still. She went into the Paynton County Jail. And that's the last we know. The parents couldn't find her for over 24 hours. Come to find out within six hours after she was in the jail, she was taken to the hospital uh, unconscious where she was on life support for two weeks and um, passed on. I mean, this is a young girl that just gave birth and the stories have changed. This jail has been known for um, treating our people in um, racist manners healthcare not being given, but that's one of our newest cases. Not only have that in the community, we have several young men that have been shot by the police, but our story has not been heard as much as uh, mainstream America. But we are here and um, we have um, several injustice things going on. Just last year, we had a motel owner here in Rapid City that refused to uh, serve Native American people. We had a big protest, several tribes within the whole nation, the Lakota nation showed up. We have a lawsuit that was uh, initiated by Indian Collective. Um, we have one that was, after that, the Department of Justice jumped in. I mean, they can't hardly hide this racism. So at some point we need um, to strengthen our circles and continue um, telling our stories. Um, and um, part of our, um, our, our focus right now is telling the world that until Leonard Peltier's case is um, told and he's released from prison, there's gonna be no justice within our, our own tribal nations. When we come to the table with the United States government, the United Nations uh, had released a report under arbitrary detention that they're just, you know, abusing him and using him as a scapegoat. Same with um, um, the recent, we have several senators that have spoken out for his freedom. And until he's in there, 
I mean, they're never going to come with a good faith effort to the table and acknowledge our people, our nation. And we're fighting for that day that they want to recognize our women. We're a matrilineal society. Um, we're bringing that back. The patriarchy had attacked our people since day one with the Calvary. Um, we have not only our identity uh, that has been attacked, but our nations, um, our leaders, I mean, and our women, you know, we all know our roles have continued. We have double roles, you know, taking care of our families and protecting them. Now we have to protect them from the school systems. We have to protect them from the police. We're out there protecting our families at ground zero and our international uh, phase has not been told yet. You know, we're still in the bottom. So I'm just um, really happy that the women that have mm -hmm. came to this forum to tell their stories that we're listening, you know, and I'd like to share that, you know, exchanging information. Um, we plan on attending the a permanent forum on Indigenous Nations coming up. And um, yeah, we want to make a big deal about 47 years in prison and Native people need to be heard. And I'm not sure where my limit is. I must be getting close. Yes, I am. You, you, you want to wrap it up? Um, yes. So um, we ask all nations to support or fight for, um, you know, we have our resources. Most resources, as we know, are located underneath our reservations, within our treaty lands. We have uh, valid treaties that have been signed by the United States government. And all we ask is for them to honor their own words. And that's not very hard. So thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean, uh, certainly for sharing your story and the fight against racism. Um, you are absolutely right. You know, our stories are uh, all the same. Our struggles are the same. And we're here, um, hopefully, uh, to raise visibility and to build uh, solidarity among Indigenous women, uh, human rights defenders. Thank you again. Um, again, I want to uh, just invite now our third speaker, Ms. Annabella Carlon. Uh, just again, a reminder to try to keep with time. Um, we have about eight minutes for each speaker. Ms. Annabella, welcome, and the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, Cristina. Y buenos días, buenas Thank tardes. you, Cristina. Good morning, good evening. When we are asked to talk about our history, personally, I believe sometimes it's very boring to talk about myself because it's also hard to do so. And we are not a product of ourselves. We are the legacy of many women that are doing something for a change, to enjoy a ride, to, to break a vicious cycle. So many things have had to happen that other women have carried out so we can be here today. And to be able to make visible our problems that we have faced since our childhood and our as defenders of human rights from a local perspective, from the local perspective of women's history, in the case of the Iyaki people, we don't have a lot of women that have different names, that, that made something important in history. We talk about in general as women participated in the defense of the territory, but we don't have a name. Like uh, many men hero that are that have gone down in history, but we don't have the name of women. Like her name did this in this movement. We only talk about them in general. Let's say Guadalupe was the first woman that, that had a bomb. And this is the only name that we can listen because it was during the phase, phase offs of the Mexican, of the Yaquis with the Mexican army, you know, there was bombing in our territories, as you know. And a lot of people remember that it was to a woman 
who the first bomb landed on. This is the only registered name that is remembered. But they don't mention a lot of women that were separated from their children because it was them that fed that spirit of struggle for the territory. So this is something that my grandmothers talked to me about and my all of the important grand women in in my culture said and it's to be a strong indigenous woman in at the time i want to be like them i want to go down in history maybe i didn't say it this way but i wanted to do something different at the time as well and I wanted to do it going to the university. And I remember that the, pro the struggle of minimizing women were there. I remember that some uncles did this to me, some people of the community, some men leaders that did not believe in women. And this is did this not disappoint me, this made me stronger. And I continued going to the university and at the university, I started to understand what discrimination was because I was different and I didn't notice it. I was living in a Yaqui territory and since we're wearing a uniform, everyone feels the same. Only at that time, I did not wear my traditional clothing. But when you go to the university, you don't wear a uniform anymore. So then I felt normal, like if, I, like if I was wearing a uniform until I started noticing that people or students started telling me things. And then I noticed that I was somebody different that dressed differently. And I said, yes, I come from a different culture. And now, because of what they're making me feel, I'm going to sh change. It was frustrating at the beginning, I'm not going to lie. But then I said, I don't care if they continue to notice me. And then I started feeling very proud. So then even if they sometimes rejected me, they recognized me by the name and that I was an indigenous woman. And I say, is this supposed to be an offense or are you recognizing me? They started to make me notice that something was happening. And since we didn't talk about discrimination or feel discrimination at the time, I did not understand the time. So then I started to realize why am I being treated this way? Because you dress differently. You, this is not common anymore. It's not trendy. And I said, yes, in my people's, yes, you dress like this. And these things started to make me stronger and building my identity as a Yaqui woman. And I felt good because I was different. Because wherever I went, there were people that said hi and happy. And then they said things that should offend you, but I, but I would never be offended for being called indigenous. This is one of the things that they would say to offend me. And these are things that set my idea to continue the legacy of many women that have done something to get out of those vicious cycles that harm our rights or that do not allow us to grow or advance because we want to have rights or enjoy rights that we don't have at the time. During the university, I took a lot of participation with linguists in the university. And this reinforced the struggle to preserve our language. I participated in a dictionary where I could study 
calmly because I could not be going in the school of law because sometimes people came and asked me and they interrupted me. So the other, the best way I found was to be in a different department for where I was studying. And this was something that really helped my, my process. And then I started to see discrimination more because as a student, I did not have people to support me in the university. It was through scholarships that I was able to attend university. And I asked for work. So in, or, in order not to hire me, they would ask me to speak English. Mm. I know that I have a few minutes left only. And yes. the only yes. thing I want to mention is, is that in Mexico, they are subtly discriminated against. A lot of Mexican authorities, when they don't want to deal with your situation, they say they tell you that we already talked to your traditional authorities or bring a letter of your traditional authority as if we could not represent ourselves nor our interests. And I have to stop here because the eight minutes are over, but we can continue to talk later on. Thank you so much, Anabella. And then just moving quickly on because we are quickly running out of time. I'd like to invite now Ms. Cara Lenina to go as our um, fourth speaker. Hi, yes. Um, hello, um, good day to my esteemed co-panelists, to our, our dear audience and to the organizers of this online activity. Magandang araw at mabuhay kayo. Good day to everyone. I am Kara Lenina Tagawa. I am a labor union organizer and currently secretary for international affairs of Kilusang Mayong Uno, or May 1st movement in the Philippines. I, was a, I started as a young activist in the college and the university, um, and I have taken part in the youth's campaign for free education in the tertiary level. That was way back 20. 14, 2015, and in 2017, together with different youth groups, we have successfully pushed for the legislation of the Free Tertiary Education Law, which now benefits all college students in state universities and colleges, especially in the far-flung areas where um, universities and state colleges and universities are limited only to a few students and young people. But after spending years of youth organizing, I began to work with the trade union movement in 2020. Since then, we have led the campaigns of workers against trade union rights violations. And we have lobbied for the ILO high-level tripartite mission to investigate the ongoing killings, harassment, and extrajudicial arrests of unionists and organizers. It was last year in October 10, I was arrested together with a transport leader for an unknown and fabricated charge of direct assault. Prior to this, we just attended a hearing after posting bail for an earlier information of a false charge of robbery filed against us. Both cases were filed by a policeman who, ex who accused us of commanding an attack against him during a peaceful protest against the anti-terrorism law. For uh, your knowledge, the anti-terrorism law was one of the most um, controversial policies that was legislated in the past years, for it allows terror tagging or counterinsurgency program of the government, which allows them to link progressive movements and progressive leaders to the counterinsurgency, uh, to their in the counterinsurgency program, which have led to terror tagging and red tagging, which eventually led to a lot of human rights violations. So we were imprisoned for 24 hours before being re released on bail. And until now, we are being obliged to face the court to clear our names. And while I'm here, I would like to apologize for being late as I came um, from a worker's picket line. We have currently a jeepney transport strike. The jeepney is a traditional public transportation in the Philippines, and it has been terror tagged 
uh, by the vice president herself saying that the jeepney um, workers strike is a communist inspired movement um, and this should uh, merit different um, harassment and in intimidation by the police so that is another part of my identity but i also i would like to introduce to you that i'm also tagakai Tagakai is um, what we call my Kalinga name. I have It's a name that I have earned as part of our tribal cultural tradition. I am of the Limos Kalinga tribe, one of the groups of Igorot from the mountains of the Cordillera found in the northern part of the Philippines. My mother, Jennifer Awingan, um, was born in Limos Kalinga. She is also part of the tribe um, uh, of Limos Kalinga. She has been a long-time indigenous people's rights activist since the 1990s. Um, she is a staff of the Cordillera People's Alliance Research Commission and is active in the campaign against large-scale mining projects and large dams, including five dam projects, one of which will affect the Sultan River in her own birthplace in Kalinga. My mother was also one of the founders of Asia Pacific Indigenous Youth Network, which has been, which is which remains as a big coalition of different indigenous peoples youth groups in the Asia Pacific. Um, to give you a brief background, the Chico River Dam project has been a long time government proposal to build large dam systems in the Cordillera region. In the 1970s, during the dictatorship of then President Marcos in the Philippines, this was one of the biggest campaigns, and it was opposed by many different tribes. But despite the human rights violations, the killings of our leaders, we have won the fight. We pushed back against the building of the Chico River Irrigation, uh, Chico River Dam project. But now, today we face the same threat under the sun. The currently, the, the president of the Philippines is the son of the, of the former president and dictator and most corrupt leader of the Philippines. So today we face the same threat to our home, which have, we have long defended, defended against colonial oppressors, against big multinational corporations, and even the government, which allows these kinds of um, uh, infiltration in, in, in our ancestral lands. My mother, Jennifer Awingan, was arrested January 30 of this year. I was uh, away from home when I received the news that my mother was arrested for the false charge of rebellion, along with six other indigenous people's rights activists. So prior, but prior to her arrest, she was already subjected to intense surveillance and harassment by state operatives. But due to strong condemnation and broad solidarity, not only in the Philippines, but all over the world, the Trump... Um, Against her arrest and the trumped up charges that were that were filed against them, she was released. My mother was released on bail after a week in prison. Now we are both uh, in our nuclear family. Only the two of us are women. The four others, my father and three um, brothers, but the two of us, the two women in our family, have been subjected to the same condition of being um, filed with trumped up charges and also are illegally arrested without due process. We have been victims of extrajudicial arrest based on false charges. And this tactic has been frequently employed by the Philippine government. And while we continue to face these cases, we also continue to struggle with the people uh, who defend their rights and sovereignty. Um, Thank you. Actually, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing the bit. Thank you, yeah. Kara. Um, today, actually, we also commemorate the Bloody Sunday Massacre that happened in 2021. Um, two of those are organizers in an indigenous people's rights community. Um, and also, at the same time, we campaign to junk the Executive Order Number 70 and the abolishment of the National Task Force and Local Communist Armed Conflict, or the ntf -LCAC, which has structured which has uh, structured mechanisms and legalized and systematized human rights violations in the Philippines. This policy allowed the bombings of self-built and sustained schools in far-flung communities of indigenous peoples, killings, illegal arrests, detention of all um, human rights defenders on the basis of terror tagging and of human rights. So it is 
to to end my um discussion, it is also in this light that we strengthen our call for the Philippine government to uphold GR number thirty nine and also at the same time to ratify the ILO Convention one ninety on the elimination of violence and harassment in the workplace. So, but while the situation is not getting better, and the Philippines has already um. Um, the, the Philippines have already withdrawn from the International Criminal Court. More and stronger international solidarity and engagements are necessary to um, pressure the government to follow um, and abide to human rights uh, and respect human rights. So while the situation is not getting better, we continue to struggle in honor of our mar marti martyred heroes and recognition of what is right and just and in aspiration of a better future, especially for their next generations. So we continue to fight. Thank you so much, Kara. And um, just uh, so we can move on, our last speaker, certainly last but not least, I'd like to welcome Ms. Uh, Mac Miller Ray. Hello, my name is MC Milare. I'm a Mapuche rapper. And as young people, we have seen systematic violence in my people, in the Mapuche people, we have more than 538 years of resilience. We are an extended people in Argentina and Chile. We are a single people and we are in both countries and we have seen repression where they said that nothing was there, but we, we had the Mapuche communities in Argentina and in Chile, we have also been present. Myself, I have grown taken from my tongue to be able to speak how we used to communicate and our ancestor communicator. I am a woman that does rap and music since I was five. And there it was where it came, the idea of representing and being the voice. And as my sister said that when we speak about ourselves, we're it's not speaking about ourselves, but it's the struggle of our ancestors, ancestors, those that represent our people, those that did not suffer any, those that suffer violence and then they were redeemed. Now I make music, I make Mapuche rap and I use it as a tool. And we don't have the right to vote nor decide for ourselves the processes that affect us today. So this struggle, this is the one that we make ourselves visible and we defend our territory, the rivers. We see the militarization of the territories on behalf of the police forces. This is my nation. We are strong, resilient people. This is how I grow. I grew from the city and not being able to live in the territory. My ancestors came very young to the city. And nowadays I make a great effort to rescue my language. This is why I grew up not speaking my language. And as a young woman, as an indigenous, we need to keep our language. The good thinking as our ancestors talked to keep our struggles alive as our ancestors did to defend our territories. Today, our brothers have been killed and silenced and disappeared because of the state and the companies here in Chile because they defended their territories. Something that is very hard to do here because violence and repression are there because we are Mapuche. We also talk about discrimination, but I believe we have been subject to discrimination, but I believe this makes us stronger and we keep our very firm identity. 
I am a Mapuche woman. I'm a student. I love music. I love to use it as a means of expression. Through music, we can be our own voice. And as young people, we also are tired of being represented. We want to be our own voice. And we want to be part in, of all processes. So this is why I'm very thankful to be here today amongst you. My name is MC Miyajai, which means golden flower. We fight to defend our territory. I make music, I make Mapuche rap. And I also recover the language of my ancestors. I get inspired from my mother and my grandmother that came here because in our communities, they were suffering from repression and abandonment. And then we did not have food and we had a lot of need and a lot of our family members had to go to the city. And this is where my grandmother had her son and we and I was raised here. So it's important for me to be not only my voice, but that, that of many people. Because living in the city, living outside of our language to have a ceremonial ground where we can connect and strengthen our spirit, it's very hard. But it's not important, but it's not impossible. Nobody should allow us to lose our identity. We have various ways of thinking, and we know that we should have our way of thinking, but we need to make ours valuable, not because we are Mapuche only, to grow in a society where we think in a different way and how we can take care and safeguard those. We need to be able to keep our ancestors' voice alive. My, my great-grandmother that lives in the community, I, we made this presence. So brothers and sisters, we need to strengthen our identity as Mapuche people, and we need to defend our ideals. And until the end, nobody's less or more. And I am very grateful for being here with you today. Thank, thank you so much, MC Millery. Uh, it's wonderful to meet all of you. Thank you all, all the speakers, all the wonderful speakers. Thank you for sharing your story. Unfortunately, uh, we are running out of time very quickly, and so we will not be able to take uh, any questions. However, uh, we are going to share the recording of this event. Um, and so now, uh, without any further delay, I'd like to again invite uh, Ms. Teresa Zapeta from CIMI to um, bring us to our final remarks and closing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. For facilitating today's meeting, first of all, I would like to honor life the existence and heritage of Sahia and Elenia Bagayai, as it was said before, Yen, Annabelle, and Mirai as well. I would like to honor their existence, their lives, because there, our struggle and the struggle and that of um, indigenous people is reflected and I would like to also mention some of the words that were said before. When when one speaks, we not we don't speak for ourselves. We speak for more people. So this is a collective gaze, so to speak. And there is a thread behind it. We there is something before us. And we also speak in the name for those to come. 
I would like to bring to the table that something that perhaps we could debate on later on, but we need to keep saying this. But sadly, we are defending ourselves from our own governments, from our own states, from the entire structure, the institutional structure. And this is the first element that should be brought to the table. And we keep we need to keep saying this. Why? Because colonization of our people has not happened. All the effects of colonization is what we can see today, here and today, that surrounds us in our everyday lives. And therefore, it is absolutely paramount to be to keep working together. This is something um, that has been mentioned by all of you. There is something we you have had to defend yourselves from the government incarceration, unjust incarceration. Secondly, that I would like to, uh, another thing that I have gathered from what we have discussed, so we keep working on it, is the following. The inter intersectionality and multi-dimension, different phases of violence, in the lives of women and children. Our colleagues here have talked about a fight to be heard, to gain visibility on behalf of women. We need to keep fighting to prevent violence. We need to keep struggling to eradicate racism, which manifests, manifests itself in different ways different struggles to defend our territories. All these facets of violence are present in our lives and also the lives of girls as well. Let's talk about good practice despite the context where we find ourselves the the journey of everyone here present and also of those who are not here with us today is the same, which is the acknowledgement of our own identity as people as well as women, but also um, our own gender identity. This is struggle, stands not only for myself, but stands also for a, collect a collective transformation access to education, access to information has been absolutely key in our journey. And I would like to tie this in quickly because we are about to wrap up with the subject theme of the um, 67th meeting that was held in New York over a few days. The subject matter was access to technology, which is a challenge access to technology it is a challenge and this technological transition we find ourselves immersed in this may be a threat to many of us and whilst this is um, this is a danger it may also lead to new opportunities to many of us and we have this absolute this uh, fundamental point that needs to be promoted for the sake of um, equal opportunities. And to close up quickly, also mentioning the importance of identity in our lives, our dresses, our, our tongues, our languages, our values, and we struggle and we fight for them. So because Wearing this on a daily basis is not easy, and this is a struggle, because by doing so, we defend our identities. So this is how we disseminate our culture as well. I should also like to thank all the efforts that were made to, to break the gap um, 
that was built by different masculinities and white people. And I would like to also say that many women uh, do not enjoy free will. Also, many girls are being persecuted. Entire communities are being attacked, are being driven away from the territories. And this is something that we cannot forget. We need to join in together to the voices that were here today, but also to those who were not here with us today, who were not present. GR39, the recommendation, as was mentioned before, is not just another tool. This recommendation helps us to connect the different tools that are already at our disposal. Um, and further strengthens those. So I, I would like to say once again that we need to make use of this um, recommendation to the best of our ability, because we have all this framework that is there to help us on the International Women's Day that is going to be celebrated tomorrow, but we should also celebrate every day. I would like to celebrate life in and of itself because that is a struggle that we indigenous women struggle on a daily basis. We not only, not only do we face physical violence, but also structural violence, access to justice, the health system, economic development. So we need to celebrate life also the life of others through the energy, through the wind, and also to celebrate the lives of those who are no longer with us, but who fought to defend our people. So this is an opportunity to, for self-recognition, to keep working, united. Thank you once again for those who share their voices here today. We are here to support you to defend each other and to defend the lives of our people. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our webinar. We look forward to further uh, conversations with you. We hope that this is only the beginning. And of course, happy International Women's Day to all of you. And thank you for all your great work.